Welcome everyone. I think it's uh, time to start. We have a lot uh, to discuss. Today we're going to have a session uh, sponsored by, uh, by RainMet and the session is entitled and Geography Derived Physiological Assessment of Coronary Artery Stenosis Severity and Microvascular Dysfunction. Um, my name is Niels van Rooij. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Radboud University Nijmegen, the Netherlands, and these are my, uh, my disclosures. Uh, and I would like to start to share with you the learning objectives of today. There are actually three of them. So the first one is to understand the principles of coronary angiography-derived fractional flow reserve, also referred to as CA, FFR, and coronary angiography-derived index of microcirculatory resistance, the CA, IMR. Then secondly, to discuss the applicability of these uh, two methodologies in the assessment of both epicardial stenosis as well as coronary microcirculation. And finally, to review the data from available trials supporting uh, CAFFR and CAIMR, and also to discuss some of the, uh, the ongoing studies. This is uh, today's team. So the, the program producer is uh, Javier Escanet, and he will also be uh, the first uh, discussant. Uh, Javier is uh, a world-renowned uh, expert on the assessment of uh, both epicardial stenosis as well as uh, microvascular dysfunction, ranging from STEMI, uh, stable coronary artery disease, but also a CMD. And next to that, he is a, a very dear friend and a very gifted uh, player of the saxophone. Maybe not for this session, but uh, he is really good. Uh, then we have uh, with us uh, Tommaso Gori. Uh, Tommaso Gori is an expert uh, in, uh, in endothelial dysfunction. He's an interventional cardiologist and he's a full professor at the University of Mainz. Uh, we also have um, a remote speaker today that will be Professor Jumbo G. He's from uh, Fudan University. Uh, he's also a, a president of the Chinese Society of Cardiology. He's an expert in IFAS, and, uh, and he's also a very gifted uh, interventional uh, cardiologist. Also remote today will be our uh, chat master, Professor Huo, uh, who is a professor at the, uh, the Institute for Force Biology in, uh, in Shanghai. So uh, also very well known with this topic. And actually, he was one of the persons that, uh, that, that, that laid the foundations for the, the development of these two techniques. And then finally, uh, co-hosting today with me is uh, Dr. Panos Xaplantiris. Um, he is a professor of interventional cardiology in, uh, in Brussels and uh, also uh, expert in the field, first author of a very nice New England uh, New Journal of Medicine paper on the five-year outcome of the FAME II. And uh, with that, uh, Panos, I would like to hand over to you to do the moderation of the session. And I hope you will all enjoy it. So good afternoon for me. Thank you all for being here in this uh, session regarding this new technology. My role as a moderator uh, is to pass on the questions that you might have to each speaker. I would also um, uh, like uh, to invite um, um, all of our, our colleagues who are um, online and not able to be here physically present to uh, post their uh, questions uh, on site. We have our chart master that will be regulating these questions uh, as well. So without further ado, I pass the microphone to Javier in order to have uh, uh, his presentation. Well, thank you, Panos, and thank you, Niels, for the nice in introduction. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to speak about uh, jazz music and <laughs> saxophone playing. I would love to, but in any case, the, what we are going to be discussing today is truly exciting. Um, it's uh, the topic of functional coronary angiography that I believe that uh, it is uh, gaining a lot of strength and force and interest uh, for the assessment of epicardial vessels, and as we will see today, also perhaps the coronary microcirculation. Now, the background for this, of course, is that uh, we, at this stage, we all agree that functional coronary angiography is a functional assessment of the circulation. is a very important way to circumvent the limitations that we have with uh, angiography in assessing coronary stenosis. But it is also true that we've seen that adoption of wire-based techniques is uh, suboptimal, probably because of um, the, what it entails, that is, instrumenting the vessel, in some cases providing vasodilators, etc. The um, system that we are discussing today, which is named coronary geography derived functional flow reserve of CAFFR, is a system that um, 
aims to provide functional information on coronary stenosis uh, based on a system that can be um, installed or moved, as you can see, it's a trolley into your CAT lab and perform uh, measurements of the coronary circulation. What are the key principles of functional coronary angiography? Most of the systems uh, use a similar approach. Uh, uh, let's review exactly the, the, the key steps of uh, CAFFR. It starts by generating a three-dimensional reconstruction of the vessel lumen. 3D QCA, in a way, is the, the starting point for, for this technique. Once that you generate this uh, mesh that actually contains all the geometric information in, in, in 3Ds, three dimensions of the vessel, what you do is you combine this with a number of equations which will provide, um, will, will generate um, um, a simulation of blood flow into these vessels and the limiting effect of coronary stenosis on, on, on blood flow. Um, the, actually, this, the uh, CAFFR use the Navier-Stokes uh, equations. These are uh, complex equations for the solution of um, fluid dynamics, and it's one of the characteristics of the, of the system. Uh, I think that that makes a difference with other systems that we have in the market, for example, with QFR. Um, the, 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 the CAFFR use, as I say, um, as, um, uh, a solution based on computational fluid dynamics using uh, finite elements to generate uh, these uh, models of flow into the coronary arteries and the effect of the coronary stenosis. And another characteristic of the system is that it, uh, for the calculation of the boundary conditions, it uses uh, the actual aortic pressure of the patient obtained from a pressure sensor that is installed in the cath lab and that is registering the aortic pressure at the time that the coronary angiograms are obtained. In that way, the simulation is based not only on assumptions, on, our, on, on not only on the on the the, the measurements, uh, geometric measurements made in the coronary arteries and the fluid dynamics, but also on actual measurements of the hemodynamics of the patient. Let's uh, have a look to how it works. The system is: you first uh, select two orthogonal views that you can see uh, here. Uh, and um, following that selection of terminal views, you get an automatic identification of the center line of the vessel and also of the mm, contour of the vessels from the angiogram. You have a tool that allows um, a, a, a refined, say, uh, adjustment of these contours to the vessel, so it, it has the possibility of performing uh, manual corrections. Once that you have obtained that, you have to enter information about flow flow velocity, and this is obtained by selecting frames uh, bef just before the contrast enters in the coronary artery and when it reaches the region of interest. Then you enter the aortic pressure, as you could see uh, there, and once that you have all this information, the system will automatically calculate CAFFR that you can see here. You can scroll down in the vessel, and we will see this in a second. Let's have a look uh, to one case performed in our CAT lab. Uh, this uh, LAD uh, vessel is my fellow, uh, Ling Wang, who is uh, actually obtaining the images, combining it with the pressure that is being obtained from the, from, from the patient. And as you can see, she has derived that in this particular patient, uh, there was a, a, CA, uh, um, a CAFFR of 0.73. Now, let's uh, focus on something that is very interesting about this modality, about functional coronary angiography. In a way, it's a technique that immediately provides co-registration with angiography. Why? Because you can locate any position, any with a with a given uh, um, CAFFR, with uh, in a certain location within the vessel, and this uh, offers very nice possibilities for analysis. For example, in the CAT lab, we use a lot um, pull, uh, longitudinal uh, pullbacks of pressure in the coronary arteries, and then we co-register them with angiography. Now, the interesting thing is that functional coronary angiography, as you can see here, provides a longitudinal analysis that is very similar to the one that you obtain with these sophisticated ways of uh, co-registering the um, uh, physiological information with the coronary angiogram. Why is that useful? It is useful because we will see more and more the value of having this longitudinal analysis to predict 
what is the functional result of our intervention. We will be interested, for example, in a situation like this where you have two different bumps of CFR to understand what happens if you are treating one specific segment or if you need to treat both of them. And this is something that I believe is going to be implemented more and more and will take us to a, to, to, to a place where we will have to, before stenting the coronary arteries, in a way demonstrate that we expect to have um, effective uh, correction of the coronary f of the flow limiting effect of coronary artery disease. <clears throat> These are some of the um, uh, subsets where you can use a CA FFR based on uh, some of the studies obtained, based on the type of patients that were included in the pivotal uh, validation studies. But you have to remember that for the time being, you cannot use uh, CA FFR and mostly most of the techniques of functional coronary angiography for osteal coronary artery stenosis, of course, myocardial bridging, like in the, in the case of invasive measurements to culprit the stenosis of ACS. Is if you have extreme severe calcification, particularly in those situations where you have uh, nodules of, uh, of calcium, it may be very difficult to obtain proper information. And also if you have extreme ISR or if the extent that you have is very uh, radiopaque. But I believe that there are a number of scenarios where we see that these techniques can be very useful. Of course, setting the indication for PCI in intermediate stenosis. In multivessel disease, it's extremely useful to really uh, obtain a functional syntax score and then to understand if the patient will be um, better treated with um, cabbage or PCI based on the on, on the number of vessels that really require treatment. I think that we will see, again, a much more, um, we will see that the importance of using functional syntax score to make decisions will, uh, will, will be appreciated more and more. When you have non culprit stenosis in patients with acute myocardial infarction, in patients with multivessel disease and acute myocardial infarction, well, you have, of course, the possibility of not performing instrumentation of the non-culprit vessel, which always, of course, entails some degree of, uh, of risk uh, in a particular uh, situation like STEMI. And for PCI planning, I mentioned before the possibility of predicting functional PCI results and to uh, avoid geographic mismatch because you immediately know which part of the vessel accounts for the, uh, function for the flow limiting effect of uh, the disease. What is the supporting evidence for CAFFR? <clears throat> this is the pivotal study, the FLASH-1 study that was uh, published in, in cardiovascular research and that included uh, uh, 328 uh, lesions. You, here you have some of the um, uh, characteristics of, uh, of these lesions. As you can see, there was 26% bifurcations. Um, and there was some 18% uh, uh, degree of, uh, of vessels with classification. So it's, it's a sort of uh, realistic uh, population. And the figures obtained in this uh, study were uh, quite encouraging. As you can see, the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value are very high. This is something that is um, really encouraging for, for the system. Um, you can also ha you also may see here the uh, values for what you will call the gray zone for FFR in this particular case. Remember that this is a, it's a study that takes as a, as a reference uh, FFR values. Here you have the agreement between F um, wire-based FFR and CA FFR, which again is, is very good with a uh, correlation coefficient of 0.89. And these are the measurements performed before and after PCI in a different study which again uh, supports the fact that uh, it may be used for um, the assessment of uh, PCI results uh, as well as to set the indication for PCI in this way. So it's, and this is a study that again uses um, invasive FFR as a sort of reference. By the way, this study is not powered really to look for uh, patient outcomes, but what they report is that actually the predictive um, value of FFR, post-PCI FFR for events in the long term is mirrored when you use uh, CA FFR. There is an ongoing uh, large study that will be very important. It's the randomized FLASH-2 st two study, which basically will be looking to the safety of decision-making based on CA FFR compared with, um, with invasive FFR in terms of patient outcomes. 
So in summary, STAFFR appears to be a robust functional coronary angiography tool for the assessment of epicardial stenosis. It has a fast analysis which is based on computational fluid dynamics. Uh, it incorporates actual aortic pressure. The available studies suggest that the measurements that you obtain in these selected populations, but still you know, quite representative the populations of clinical practice, with the exclusion criteria that we mentioned, is, is, uh, is associated with high positive and negative predictive values. And, um, and there, is, there, there will be upcoming trial-based evidence speaking about the safety of decision-making based on CFFR compared with FFR in terms of uh, patient clinical outcomes. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Javier, for this deep dive into the um, basics of this new technology. Um, just to kick off this discussion, and please uh, step up to the <coughs> microphone in case you have uh, uh, any question that comes up uh, to mind. Please also feel, feel free to participate uh, on our uh, chat. Um, um, so uh, just to kick off this discussion, my, my, my question to you, since you have been exposed to this technology, how, is it, how easy is it to use in daily practice? And second, and um, equally important, how does it compare with what we already have at our disposal uh, at the cath lab? So, uh, as, 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 as you could see in the video that I uh, showed to you, the system is a system that you bring into the cath lab and you perform the measurements by the, by the table. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like an additional tool that you have there. You have a pressure sensor that has to be connected to the system, it takes, you know, perhaps one minute to connect the pressure sensor. And considering that the analysis that uh, uses is time consuming, or, or if you wish, um, uh, com uh, requires a lot of computer uh, power, the solution that uh, they found in terms of implementing computational fluid dynamics is, is solved quite quickly. I will say that you probably have the, the completion of the study in something like four or five minutes, roughly, which is similar perhaps to other systems of uh, functional coronary angiography, and that probably compares you know, to what uh, it will take to take a, a pressure guide wire from the shelf and put it into a coronary axis. I will say that there is no much difference. So, uh, alluding to this question, we have um, 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 a question from the chat um, demanding or asking about the, the differences between this technology and uh, angio-derived technologies such as uh, QFR, FFR, angio, and so on and so forth. Uh, we might uh, want to touch on, on this subject. And uh, another question coming from, from our chat is uh, why we cannot use this technology in cases of severe instant restenosis. Well, starting from the from the last um, from the last point, uh, the idea of not applying it in in severe stenosis refers to the situation where you may have um, stents that are radio opaque or situations where, for whatever reason, you know you you uh, you think that there may be an interference of the stent with uh, very thin lumens. That's basically the idea. Um, there are. There are no dedicated studies on external stenosis for CAFFR that I'm aware. I'm not aware of any of them. There are some studies. Uh, actually, we published one of them with QFR, which uh, speaks of, um, of the value of these techniques for, for this. The difference with other techniques, for example, with QFR, um, refers mainly to the way of computation. So the formulas that are used in QFR is the sum of multiple six segments uh, drops of pressure estimated from uh, friction and flow separation losses that you have, while here you have a um, true computational fluid dynamic finite element-based solution, much more complex from a computational standpoint, more similar, just to, to give you an example, to what hard flow performs with uh, with um, CTFFR, which requires a supercomputer. So it is a simplified uh, solution. And the other uh, key element is the um, incorporation of a sensor that takes uh, aortic pressure. With QFR, you don't need that sensor. So it, uh, the, the system assumes a particular uh, aortic pressure and a solution for that. Thank you for these answers. So um, let's um, wrap this first presentation. We have a question, question from the audience at the back. Please do not hesitate to. Yes, there are microphones there yes. if you wish to take your.
Hello. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned the incorporation of aortic pressure uh, as a good uh, boundary condition for the proximal part of the vessel. Is there any assumption on the collaterals or the distal part of the vessel in terms of boundary condition? It's, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, there is no information looking into the um, effect of collateral flow. So if, uh, you know, if any of the colleagues has, uh, wants to have a field for research, this is a fantastic uh, area of research. I mean, what is the effect of um, concealed collateral circulation on the agreement between invasive FFR and, uh, and CAFFR or QFR or whatever? It's a, it's a very good point. Please step up to the microphone. Yeah. FFR is uh, taken as measure under hyperemia, and this method, no. The, there is different relation with IFR, for example, or more uh, correlation. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the reason because um, FFR requires hyperemia is because what you want to do is to um, generate the maximal flow to, in a way, to to have a linear relationship between pressure and flow. But in this particular system, what you are doing is assuming uh, a hemodynamic um, uh, an hydraulic analog of the system where you calculate the drop of pressure for a given hyperemic flow. So all these systems actually have some assumptions about how much the flow will increase during maximal hyperemia. And it's a boundary condition, it's something that the system incorporates into it. So it takes into account that, for example, if you derive some flow um, velocity from the Timmy frame count, that is what the system does, then introduces a factor of correction. Uh, and it, it is described in the, in the original publication, if you're interested, that is in cardiovascular research. It is. S sorry, if I... <coughs> If I can, uh, can jump into the discussion, it is, uh, however, true that part of the discrepancy between IFR and FFR and between QFR and FFR is in the uh, differences in the capacity of the microvasculature to react to hyperemic agents. So it is indeed an assumption that we make uh, when, when we calculate QFR or CAFFR, where we assume that the, that the hyperemia will be uh, standardized over, over patients, and when we measure the FFR, where we actually uh, try to achieve at least uh, hyperemia, and we don't achieve it in patients that have a poor response. So, so that's a, and, and that's something that is important, perhaps, is that uh, this is the, perhaps you may say, is the Achilles heel, but it's also, it may be also a big, big advantage. I'm going to give you an example. If, um, there is a big controversy now after the flower MI study, for example, that when you are measuring non carpet stenosis uh, in the context of a STEMI, uh, there is no benefit, and even there was an excess of events in the, in the patients that were deferred. One of the hypotheses is that in the context of a STEMI, the flow is limited by the boundary condition, by the situation that the patient is, but later, actually, once that it returns to be normal, the microcirculation, the stenosis might be severe. You can speculate that because this technique is not influenced by boundary conditions, it may actually predict better what is going to be the result of the flow limiting stenosis in the long term that, I, that FFR. But that's something that is speculative and also applies also to, to aortic stenosis. In aortic stenosis, if you have very severe aortic stenosis, there is big discrepancy between QFR and, um, and, um, and, uh, and FFR. Is it because QFR is wrong? Or is it because FFR is being influenced by a situation that is going to be relieved very soon once that you implant the TAVI? So in case we don't have any further questions, we can move on to the second uh, discussant, uh, Professor Junbu uh, Ye, who will be connecting remotely uh, to this session. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor. Can you hear us? I think we have an issue with the connection. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, all the chairpersons. Uh, I apologize for not being able to join you because of uh, the Omicron in Shanghai we are restricted to, to travel. So I would like to uh, introduce a new 
uh, index or a new parameter we call CIMR to, for assessing the microcirculatory resistance using the coronal angiogram. I do not have uh, any potential conflict of interest to this report. So uh, coronary microcirculation or uh, microcirculatory dysfunction have recently shown an increased importance of the diagnosis and the management of patients with chronic coronary syndromes. The index of uh, we call microcirculatory resistance uh, is well as established a parameter for assessing coronary circulation, especially micro, uh, microvasculature. While uh, there is no reliable user-friendly method, therefore, uh, we propose a novel coronary angiographically derived IMR, we call it CIMR, which shows good diagnostic performance compared with uh, the previous wire uh, derived IMR in previous uh, retro uh, retrospective studies. This uh, CIMR is an initiative parameter to evaluate the function of a coronary microcirculation based on coronary angiography. Based on coronary angiogram from at least two uh, projections um, of the target vessel uh, using the diagnostic velocity obtained by the Timmy frame method, the flash angular system can get real-time aortic pressure wave achieved by the flash map pressure sensor. Though the optimal, uh, the, then afterwards, through the optimal accurate or CFD, CFD uh, model, the CFFR, CIMR are achieved. In the previous presentation, um, the, uh, the presenter gives the CFFR. We use the same system, but we now uh, add a CFD uh, model to achieve uh, these uh, two parameter and uh, to interpret both epicardial and microcirculatory function. Uh, in our previous uh, retrospective study, uh, using this uh, angiographically uh, derived uh, CIMR, uh, we have shown that high diagnostic accuracy in terms of microvascular resistance. The consistency level and the AUC of the CIMR are equally uh, represent the microvascular dysfunction in different scenarios in steel vagina, unsteel vagina, and myocardial infarction. And also, in addition, that uh, the CIMR showed a very good prognostic performance in predicting the major adverse cardiac event in the different clinical settings. So therefore, uh, based on our, our uh, previous uh, 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 experience, uh, that is all retrospective study, we now uh, initiate a prospective multi-center study to evaluate the effectiveness and the safety of this uh, coronary angiography derived index that we call CARMR. And this is uh, the, the, uh, uh, the purpose, as I mentioned, the main purpose of, uh, the, main purpose of the study was to evaluate the feasibility, accuracy, and the safety of online CIMR that produced by this device, uh, you show uh, you show the here. I have a next slide also. This produced by the Remed Medical Technology compared with the wide based IMR. The study is a registered clinical trial to verify the measurement function of a CIMR. This is the device we use for the standard measurement. This uh, uh, indexed from uh, the RADI, uh, now uh, run by Abbott. And this is our uh, device, uh, tensile device, what we call the flash angel for C uh, IMR system. Yeah, the study is a prospective multi-center blind paired design self-controlled registered clinical trial. The IMR and the CIMR operators are blinded to each other. And uh, this CIMR and IMR were performed in the same project and in the, in the same patient or subject to verify the accuracy and the safety of a CIMR and the definitions of coronary microcirculation uh, micro dysfunction uh, are de uh, defined as follows. If the IMR or CIMR 
is uh, greater than 25. Uh, uh, altogether, 116 patients are enrolled, and um, the central random system is used for the random entry. Patients were selected continuously, uh, and each center competed for ad admission until the total number of cases was met. And uh, all, the, uh, the, uh, all the data was uh, sent to, for the central collaboratory for analysis. Yeah, patients who underwent uh, uh, coronary angiogram for stable or unstable angina uh, were suspected uh, enrolled for this uh, study. The age uh, was 18 to 80 years old, regardless of, of gender, uh, with signed informed consent. Patient with acute or old myocardial infarction, patient with uh, uh, primary or secondary myocardial or whatever disease, the uh, ejection fraction less than uh, 35%, renal uh, insufficiency or allergy to contrast agent or adenosine or ATP, or severe organ disease of life expectancy less than 20, uh, 24 months were excluded for study. But for the angiographic criteria, the, by a visual inspection, the angiographic coronary stenosis was less than 50%. This is because we evaluated the microvasculature. And the patient uh, with uh, coronary fistula and myocardial bridging was excluded. And poor feeling contrast with the uh, image was excluded. Patient with uh, left man or right coronary oscillation was ex excluded. And the patient uh, investigator thought that the patient could not tolerate the ex examination was also excluded. The, the primary endpoint, as I mentioned, we, to evaluate the accuracy of the CIMR compared with the wire-derived uh, IMR. The secondary endpoint is to evaluate the sensitivity, specificity, positive and uh, negative predictive value uh, of this CIMR compared with the result of the wire-derived uh, IMR. We compared with the result of uh, IMR, the ROC curve, and the AUC uh, of uh, CIMR in the diagnosis of coronary myocardial function also evaluated. The diagnostic characteristics of uh, offline and online was both compared. This image actually illustrates how uh, the uh, CIMR and IMR uh, was uh, measured. Then we have to take two uh, projection for uh, for uh, two projection of coronary angiogram to you first we use using the wire uh, derived uh, FFR uh, IMR calculate IMR and also we calculate just like the pre uh, previous presentation the C FFR and we calculate the C IMR and this patient with a preserved microvascular function you see the FFR with a wire was 0.88 the IMR was 10. The CFFR using this uh, flash uh, device is uh, 0.9, and the, uh, the CIMR is so 9.4. The second case, even with, though, without any severe stenosis, the patient with uh, uh, we call microcirculatory dysfunction, the wire derived FFR is uh, 0.93 without stenosis, without uh, stenosis, and the wire derived IMR is 41. And using the CFFR is 9.6 without stenosis, and the, the, the CIMR is 41.3. So very consistent. And uh, yeah, all uh, together, uh, the, the data was available in 113 patients. This uh, uh, graphic uh, illustrates the demographics of all the patients with 62.9 uh, years old. Uh, part uh, or uh, roughly um, um, more than half a female uh, with a normal LD function and two thirds with hypertension and four third, uh, four, one fourth with um, um, uh, diabetes and uh, nearly half with uh, dyslipidemia and so on and so on. And you will find that also the uh, all the vessels uh, LED, uh, uh, circumflex, uh, right coronary artery are evenly uh, distributed and the the, without severe stenosis, the main percent of stenosis only 23%. And uh, you will find in this, uh, in this uh, slide that uh, this is the uh, I, uh, IMR derived, and this is the CI uh, IMR. There's good relationship between these two parameters, and uh, we calculate the difference between the mean CIMR and IMR. There's also good uh, uh, consistency. 
And if you uh, analyze the sensitivity uh, by the area under curve, the, uh, it's, uh, the parameter is uh, 0.963. It's a very consistency. Therefore, the result is, shows that uh, the CIMR has high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity compared with the wire-based IMR. The CIMR uh, could, re uh, could reduce the demand of pressure wire because it is only need the uh, this is AI uh, CFD uh, assisted parameter without any pressure wire could uh, reduce the demand of pressure wire, uh, technical error, and potentially increase the uh, the uh, uh, adoption of a physical assessment of a coronary microcirculation. The offline analysis is in good agreement with the online result. You see, this is uh, the online. Uh, C uh, uh, IMR. This is the offline C IMR with good accuracy and sensitivity. Especially, the negative predicted value is uh, ninety-seven percent. Therefore, based on this uh, uh, prospective uh, observation, we can uh, uh, summarize that the C IMR hold several potential advantage. One, first, the risk for manipulation of uh, thermal dilution pressure wire related complications is eliminated. Uh, second, no injection of saline, no vessel dilator, reduced, uh, reduced measurement time. Third, the technical instability of wire-based physiological assessment is eliminated. Fourth, the wire-free and a CFD-derived CIMR can assess multivessel disease quickly without requirement for guiding catheters and a wire exchange. Fifth, the CIMR allows for rapid reassessment of pre and post-PCI, allowing the confirmation of the presence of a microcirculatory dysfunction. Sixth, a combination of CFFR just presented in the previous presentation and CIMR could enhance the physiological assessment of micro, that means epicardial, and microvascular disease in patients with ischemic heart disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yi, for this um, update on um, CAIMR and ongoing studies. If there's one question from the floor, please do not hesitate to step up. No. So in this case, we move on to the last uh, discussion uh, for this session. Uh, Tommaso will uh, give us an update on uh, studies uh, based on CAFFR and CAIMR. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here and presenting the, uh, those data. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm being told that there is uh, no time, that I should be very, very fast. So this is my disclosure. There are no disclosures. Very, that, that was very fast. So the, uh, the two previous presenters presented, in a way, the, the past, the background, why this, how the system works, how uh, the, the uh, validation has been performed. What I'm presenting is the present and the future of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, area. Um, so just, uh, uh, just keep in mind, just, you don't really need it. Uh, uh, the, the background is there, it has been said already. Uh, CA FFR of uh, smaller than 0.8 indicates a lesion that might need revascularization or PCI or uh, cabbage. Uh, CA FFR larger than 0 0.80, which equivalent to the FFR invasively measured, indicates a lesion that should not be treated or deferred. And a CA IMR analog, uh, analog to the uh, uh, invasive IMR over 25 indicates microvascular uh, uh, dysfunction. So this is uh, something that we measure. This is a live uh, measurement, so actually live, live in a box, a measurement that we performed in, uh, in Mainz. This is Dr. Blessing here, um, a young physician. This screen here was the, uh, the uh, 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 RayMed uh, uh, measurement. And this is myself. You have a fellow from China. I, I'm doing it myself. Uh, live being done on this uh, right uh, coronary artery. And this is really live. This is what, what really happens as Dr. Blessing makes the, uh, the angiography. So this is uh, about uh, 
One minute later, you have a 3D reconstruction of the, of the vessel. Then I calculate the flow velocity based on the timiferin count. Then I enter the uh, blood pressure. Then the computer calculates the uh, uh, CFD-based uh, FFR. And th in this case, it was 0 0.90. Of course, there was no stenosis. This is just a case to show how uh, the system uh, the system works. So, having said that, what are the possible application? Of course, uh, infinite uh, in the uh, in the field of coronary artery disease: silicon lesions, tandem lesions, multivessel lesions, diffuse lesions, bifurcation lesions, mm, and so on, including post PCI um, assessments. And I will present a couple of uh, uh, of cases that we uh, that we measured in uh, um, in mines. This is a male, 56 years old, with a stable angina since about three years. He had a CT scan indicating a lesion in the proximal um, LAD. At angiography, there was the typical intermediate uh, lesion, and after performing CA uh, FFR, it was indeed a positive uh, lesion, also uh, an ischemia-inducing uh, lesion and post PCA, PCI CAFFR was 0 0.95, confirming the efficient treatment. So very basic um, case. This is another case, and, uh, uh, and Javier, you, you pointed out this type of uh, patient. This is a male, 85 years old. He has an aortic stenosis of great fear. He has a great four, sorry, he has asthma, so two relative problems for the administration of a vasodilator and the measurement of, uh, uh, of an invasive FFR. Plus, like all patients with, uh, with an advanced age and uh, aortic stenosis, he has tortuous vessels, you will see it in a minute, and calcific vessels. So this is again live, the measurement of the CA FFR uh, as performed by myself. This is the LAD. There were, of course, several uh, projections in, being made. And this is again the, uh, uh, me setting the... Uh, um, contours of the vessel. Now, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit overdoing it. You only need two uh, extremes, proximal and distal, usually. usually. I've overdone it in this, uh, in this case. This is the 3D reconstruction. Then comes the measurement of the uh, uh, flow velocity based on the timmy frame count. Next step, in this case, if you, if you were fast enough to see the pressure, the blood pressure was very low. So the boundary con condition in, that, in this case really influenced the significance of the, of the stenosis. And in this case, the, uh, um, sorry, the result was 0 0.83. Now I want to repeat it in response to your question before. This is a measurement, so every system is based on different assumptions. This is a measurement based on the uh, invasive blood pressure and the anatomic, uh, uh, actually a 3D reconstruction of the anatomy of the vessel. The FFR measures something else. It measures an invasive pressure. So you can't really compare the two. I'm, I'm totally uh, in agreement with, uh, with Javier when he says uh, um, it, they, they do measure different things. Yeah, so it's really hard to say what's better and what's worse. It's two different, uh, two different things. Comparable, maybe, uh, very well uh, uh, um, um, correlating with, with each other, but two different, uh, two different things. Um, now, special conditions are uh, tandem lesions where the FFR is uh, uh, limited by a crosstalk between lesions. Um, as Javier showed already, you can do an art, a kind of uh, a pullback in this, uh, uh, in this system and measure the hemodynamic rele relevance of each of the two lesions separately. And of course, treat first the one with the higher gradient and then second, measure again the relevance of the second lesion once you have treated the first one. The case of diffuse lesions is very, very similar, only in this case, of course, you will not, not have a single um, pressure step. In this case, you will have a stenosis length of uh, that is much longer, not, uh, not focal, a uh, uh, CAFFR that reflects the CAFFR of the whole vessel, and a delta CAFFR which reflects the delta CAFFR of that lesion that you're, that you're measuring over the 56 uh, millimeters. Now, this is, uh, this is the case that, presented, that Dr. Jamboji uh, presented. This is a case of IMR. This is a patient with uh, uh, an acute, uh, sorry, Next one is the one with, the, with acute myocardial infarction. This is a simple measurement of microvascular dysfunction, CA IMR of 35 or 36 in a patient with a normal CA mm, FFR. 
Now, this is a more interesting case, a male, 53 years old, with hypertension, symptoms to balloon time, unfortunately, six hours. Of course, STEMI. And as we know from these stats, from the invasive studies, a high IMR after treatment, after successful treatment of the, uh, of the STEMI lesions is uh, uh, associated with a worse, with a larger infarction due to microvascular obstruction and with a worse prognosis of the patient. Now, this patient, this specific patient, came back three months later, again with, uh, uh, with angina. There was a good result in the, in the LAD and the CA, CA IMR was 62. So, compatible with, uh, with a microvascular dysfunction in the territory that three months uh, uh, before had a, a myocardial infarction. Now, having jumped through the cases at the fastest speed that I, that I could, I will present uh, a couple of slides uh, on the studies that are now ongoing, and this is a real, uh, something that I really appreciate of this company, the commitment to, uh, to research. Now, um, um, correlation is not the same as clinical equivalence. So therefore, the studies that have been presented until now uh, justify and document the correlation between invasive measurements and this analysis of uh, FFR. The next slides that we'll present now uh, uh, refer to studies that are, are done to uh, document the, equivalent, the clinical equi equivalence of this method as compared to invasive uh, FFR. Now, FLASH2 has been presented already by um, Javier. The estimated, estimated end time is 23 at the, at the end of the, of the year, and it's a comparison uh, over 12 months follow-up of CA FFR versus uh, Guidewire standard FFR. It's a prospective multicenter randomized uh, controlled trial with 2,132 patients over uh, 40 centers. And this is the, uh, the uh, schedule of the, of the trial. Now, there is another trial uh, similar, of course, a little bit smaller, with uh, patients uh, uh, with bifurcation lesions. In this study, 350 uh, patients, otherwise similar endpoints and similar uh, design. In this case, the first lesion will be uh, treated as, uh, as needed, and then uh, the invasive versus the, uh, 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 sorry, the uh, um, angiography-based decision versus the CAFFR decision will be compared in terms of outcome of the side branch. Now, the, the one very interesting study, not that the other ones are not interesting, but this one is really interesting, is uh, um, on the prognosis of patients with uh, uh, after STEMI based on the CA. IMR, and this is a study on 400 patients in, uh, five, in five hospitals, followed up for um, 12, uh, 12 months. So having said that, uh, in the fastest way that I uh, could, in summary, coronary function uh, uh, measurement uh, system, so the CAFFR is a coronary function measurement system that is non-invasive, that is uh, a combination of both epicardial and microvascular uh, function based on a CFD uh, uh, protocol. There is no use of a pressure wire and no vasodilation induced by uh, uh, drugs. And uh, there is uh, uh, um, an assessment or is based on the assess invasive assessment of blood pressure in order to uh, be more accurate at the boundaries of blood pressure. Patients with very high blood pressure, pati patients with uh, uh, lower blood pressure, especially in conditions like aortic stenosis. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I made it. Yes, you should right indeed. Time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this wrap-up and these nice illustrative cases. If there's uh, only one question from the floor, otherwise I would ask Niels to wrap up the session with the key messages. Yes, thanks a lot. Your colleague, Dr. Blessing, that's a great name for an interventional cardiologist, right? <laughs> She's blessed. She's a bless for us. Wow. <laughs> um, now, uh, what I'll do is I'll wrap up with some key, uh, key uh, um, uh, messages uh, real quickly. So I think we saw an exciting glimpse into the, uh, the possible future. Uh, I think uh, both uh, uh, measurements uh, hold promise. Uh, of course, uh, big advantage that you don't need a wire, you don't need adenosine. Also, they've shown high accuracy, as you showed, uh, but that, that's not enough. So uh, I think we should await the, uh, the large upcoming uh, randomized clinical trials. And with that, I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to thank the audience for being here, and I would like to uh, uh, thank the sponsor for making this possible. And enjoy the rest of your PCR sessions.